Where do you go next, Max? Back in time to when I picked up my creatures. By now they're so hungry they could eat a zigzag. What's a zigzag? Kind of like a hippo, but with feathers. Quite well. How are you? I am also quite well, and I am rather thrilled that we are back here for episode number what? 305. Episode 305 of Modern Technology Watches. Modern Technology Watches! The Miami episode. Miami episode? 305. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're kind of a nerd. I am? Yes. <gasps> How dare you impugn my character in that way? All the phone freaks in the audience will be very proud. How very <laughs> dare you. In fact, we're both a couple of nerds. We're a couple of film nerds. We are a couple of film nerds, and we're a couple of film nerds because we are a married couple of film nerds. And on this here podcast here, we show each other films, generally speaking, from our joint collection that the other has not seen. That's what we do here on Modern Technology Watches. And do you know what? What? This time it's my pick. I get to choose a movie. I get to inflict it upon you. Okay, so I think I need to organize my sock drawer. So <laughs> thanks for asking. I'm going to go. No, no, no. Your sock drawer is not where this episode's movie is. It is instead on the DVD shelf. It's on the DVD shelf. Yes. Okay, so. So. Are you going to go over to the DVD shelf? I'm going to go over to the DVD shelf. Okay, I'm going to stay here because I have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. Because it's your pick and I'm not at all nervous about that. <laughs> all right. Well, if you'll excuse me. Okay, I'm going to stay here. Stay and here. I'm going to I'm going to stay here and I'm going to talk to your empty chair. And I will say that your choice in 302, I enjoyed. I enjoyed significantly. So, who knows what's about to happen here, dear li Well, you know what's about to happen, dear listeners, because you've seen the episode title. I, however, am waiting to be surprised. And I even have my eyes closed right now. You didn't have to do that. You're facing away from the I am, but DVD when you came shelf. back, I closed my eyes when I heard you coming back. Well, that's, uh, that's mighty sporting of you. And I will hand you this thing that I have behind my back here. You're making a face. I have no idea. Oh, this is okay. So, listeners, he has just handed me the Blu ray disc of Flight of the Navigator, which seems to be a small child underneath an oyster shell that is emitting light. <laughs> yes, that's precisely what this movie's about. It's 1978, and 12 year old David Freeman is mysteriously knocked unconscious while out playing. He wakes up and heads for home, only to find strangers living there. It's now 1986. And he's been missing for eight years. He discovers a top-secret spaceship, and with the help of Max the computer, sets off on an incredible mission to get back to the past, where he belongs. Okay. Rob? Yes? What, what inspired you here? <laughs> well, this movie, which I saw when it was released in 1986, mm -hmm. it is of the genre of 80s kids' adventure movies, of which there were so very many. And I always like this one. It's an obscure one. It wasn't quite a Disney movie. Disney ended up distributing it. But it was also kind of a cult movie. And it was one of those movies that you couldn't find for the longest time. Mm -hmm. This copy that we have here is a Blu-ray. It was released by a company called Second Sight Films, which specializes in getting the rights to weird stuff that people want that isn't out. They put it out in 2019 with new... My God, it's restorations. There's interviews... Yeah, all, all that kind of good stuff that you can go deep into uh, Blu-ray disc. I thought Randall Kleiser died. <laughs> Randall Kleiser is not dead. Okay. Randall Kleiser is the director of this movie. Right. It stars a kid named Joey Kramer. You know, one or two other people that you might recognize, but I won't spoil anything. And it's a nice little bit of mid-80s, weird-ass, kid-aimed sci-fi. But I was kind of obsessed with it. Well, all right. All Let's right. Fly away with the navigator. Yes. We will ask our pal Torley to play some music. Yes. After that music, we will come back and we will have watched 1986's 
Flight of the Navigator. Flight of the Navigator. All right. Okay. Let's navigate. <laughs> back we are back we have just watched 1986's flight of the navigator that we did (laughs) okay so you haven't really seen this Mm -hmm. in like 36 years something like that i saw it i think twice in the theater Mm -hmm. because as i'm remembering the first time my step-grandmother took me to see this my stepmother's mother right who had me alone for for some reason. It was one of those weird family combinations that don't happen a lot. Like, we would go visit her and stuff, and uh, we would gather at gatherings, but we, she wouldn't be babysitting us alone without my dad, my stepmom. So to be there without your dad, without your stepmom, without your sister. Yes, my sister wasn't there either. So it sticks Um, in the brain because it was you and her, and that didn't happen very much. Yeah, no, it did not happen very much at all, but she took me to see this movie, and it was just the two of us, my step-grandmother and I, and I loved it. I was pretty obsessed with it. I was like drawing stuff from it and and everything. You know, 1986, I would have been uh, eight years old when this came out, I believe. Yeah, this came out in August of 1986. So I would have been eight. And then I'm pretty sure we went back with my dad, my stepmom and my sister. I'm sure I saw it like once or twice, maybe on TV since then. But still, when I was a kid, like I have not gone back and watched this as an adult. So having now seen it mm-hmm. as an adult, yes, what do you think? I liked it. I liked it. It really it it holds up for me. I'm so glad. I'm I'm <laughs> you, thrilled you, you, for you. You you can't see the uh, the condescending pat on the knee <laughs> she just gave me while saying this, listeners. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure you know about it because I think it's an important part of I don't think this it was exchange. A condescending pat on the knee. I'm just I'm I'm glad it held up for you. I'm glad we're not having like a Dow of Steve <laughs> thing happening here. No, no, this is definitely not a reverse Dow of Steve maneuver. I I thought it was a fun watch. Now watching it I can see the strings on the puppets and everything, but yeah, I think it holds up well. I think it's a beautiful print of the movie. Second Sight Films here did this uh, restoration job on it. The Blu-ray looks great. Gila. Yes, Rob. What did you think of 1986's Flight of the Navigator? What did I think of 1986's Flight of the Navigator? <laughs> <sighs> now, remember, faces you're making cannot be heard by our I know, dear audio podcast medium. listeners. Audio medium, I know. <laughs> Primarily, it made me sad. It's... Mm sad Mm. for so many reasons it made me sad Mm -hmm. and not least because you never got to the whole family was like yeah okay this presumed dead kid is back and that's cool and great we're moving on and like look i understand movie for kids Mm -hmm. but like he was really sad yeah and i get that Mm -hmm. it was trying to be a lot of different things at the same time Mm -hmm. beautiful print absolutely Howard Hesseman is the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Real tough for me. Yeah. Johnny Fever, the teacher from from head of the class. Mm-hmm. Not why no. Uh-uh. I can't I can't grok him being a bad guy. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call him a bad guy as such in this. Well, he's as close as you get to a bad guy. He's the one from NASA who wants to keep David under inspection and away from his family. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I would contend, yeah, he's the closest thing this movie has to a bad guy. True, true. We can explore that. I wonder if I would have felt different if I saw it as a kid. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of movies that came out when we were children that were trying to do a lot of different things and were designed to be for kids and like maybe shouldn't have been. Like you and I have spoken about The Peanut Butter Solution. (laughs) Yes. That movie fucked me up real bad. (laughs) Yeah. Real bad. And I can only imagine that had someone taken me to see Flight of the Navigator, which in the summer of 1986, I was five. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. It would not have gone over well. Okay. How about if you were eight? If you happened to be eight when this was in a movie theater? I can't imagine it would have landed that much better for me. Mm -hmm. And just to make it dark for a second, the summer I was eight was the summer after my grandpa died. And... This movie has a lot to say about 
loss and about missing people and about who you can become in the absence of the people you love. It's fucking hard. I don't think I would have liked it all that much better when I was eight either, is all I'm saying. It's funny you put it that way, because the summer of I was eight, when this movie came out, I had lost my grandfather Mm -hmm. that spring. Yeah. I can see what you're saying. And it also, I think, speaks to something that I really needed at that point in my life, which I would grasp at whenever I could get it from fiction with stuff like this. I mean, the kid gets an alien spaceship robot as his new best pal. And, you know, I would have dug that. I think that was the kind of escapism I needed when I was still dealing with and processing that loss. And which was, of course, the first time I had lost anybody Mm -hmm. to that degree. It was the first time death really touched me. I had also, this is four years after E.T., the extraterrestrial, Mm -hmm. tore ass through pop culture, obsessed uh, most of the children who saw it in 1982. And... A ton of movies came out after that that were trying to be that, that were trying to do the same thing. You mean like Mac and Me? <laughs> yes, like Mac and Me. Mac and Me, uh, uh, Pod People, so many uh, other junky ass movies came out where a kid ended up with like a best friend that was some kind of alien robot puppet thing. And I think this is one of the good examples of that. I think this is one of the examples of that, that that made it feel real, in no small part, thanks to the person playing the the alien robot spaceship. Ah, yes, Paul Mall. Paul Mall. <laughs> we can maybe uh, get into the cast. I think maybe it's time to do that. Let's do that. But. 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 I have one other thought about the movie in general. Okay. Okay. It's like one of those things, it's like a, a stealth movie. Mm-hmm. Because in a weird way, it's a, it's a meditation on grief and acceptance and Mm -hmm. identity but it's wrapped up in spaceship Mm -hmm. spaceship 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 and (laughs) how did it do box office wise so according to wiki here the uh, budget was nine million dollars in 1986 money and the box office was about double that 18 million five and change Okay. So it's not like it flopped on its face. It's not like it flopped on its face. But then again, this was not one that stuck. E.T. the Extraterrestrial, you could get that on video and you could get that on DVD and it was still around and they made other things spun off of it and toys and all this stuff. Flight of the Navigator, it happened in theaters and then that was it. It was gone. And I'm also kind of surprised that they didn't try to, you know, in the same way that now if you get a print of Hackers, it's like... Angelina Jolie and some other people. Yes. <laughs> they haven't re-released this as Sarah Jessica Parker and some other people. Yeah. Yeah. And when we get when we get into the cast, we'll uh we'll get into that. <laughs> but but yes, very uh young Sarah Jessica Parker in uh you looked it up, it's her third movie. Third or fourth, yeah. Yeah, she was a very minor supporting character. I remember seeing this as a kid and thinking, oh yeah, there's a cute girl. There's a cute young woman. <laughs> and there's a little bit of weird squick behind that for me, too. Like, the whole interaction of those two characters mm-hmm. is a little weird. And then you have to wonder if at the end he's going to be like, oh, hey, she's going to move here in a few years. I should look her up. Ah. You know, I didn't think about that. Like, after he gets back to his own time, he'd be about the same age as her. Yeah. Hmm. Or maybe even a little older. Whoa. But knowing that he was going back to his own time with the knowledge of where he had been, Mm -hmm. and even with a souvenir, for lack of a better term. (laughs) Yes, and we'll definitely get to that. Do you Uh, think the dog was going to eat it? (laughs) I would assume the dog was going to eat it. (laughs) You mean eat his little pal? Yes. Yes. No, not the dog was going to die. The dog was going to (laughs) consume the, what's it called? Platzer maker. (laughs) Pluffin Garber. Herfer Durfer. <laughs> we'll, 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 uh, we'll get into that when we get to, <laughs> to the plot. But I think a bunch of the cast here we're not going to bother with. Okay. If we're starting at the bottom of the cast list here and going up, I think the first one we really want to talk about is Howard Hesseman as Dr. Lewis Faraday. Okay. So first of all, they named him Dr. Faraday. 
Mm-hmm. Could they just have called him Sciency McScience? Would that have been okay too? <laughs> Faraday's a nice, a nice little nod. Yeah, yeah. But when they were like Doctor Faraday, I looked at you and I was like, seriously, <laughs> seriously. Yes, a, a nod to the real life Doctor Faraday. Oh my god! You know what? Mm-hmm. When they locked David in that room, mm-hmm. do you know where he was? Yes. He was in a Faraday cage. <laughs> Dr. Faraday locked him in. Ergo, Faraday cage. Faraday cage. <sighs> I was trying to explain a Faraday cage once, but I had forgotten the phrase. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's that thing and you can't use your phone. And <laughs> and, and people are like, an airplane? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like a box. And they're like... <laughs> And your phone doesn't work. It's a box and your phone doesn't work. I was like. (laughs) I stopped a meeting cold for a few minutes because I could not remember the term Faraday cage. Oh, my dear. That is amazing. (laughs) Okay. I already know what my favorite part of this episode is. And it's right there. It's all downhill from here. Howard Hesseman. Howard Hesseman. Okay. DJ Johnny Fever. DJ Johnny Fever. From WKRP in Cincinnati. From WKRP in Cincinnati. And this was 1986. Mm-hmm. He was the teacher mm-hmm. on Head of the Class. The sitcom. The sitcom. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. 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 Charlie, Charlie Moore. Charlie Moore. They Charlie just called Moore. him Charlie most yes. of the time. Oh, and he passed away a few months ago. He did. Much he has missed. Holy buckets! We're looking at uh, his Wikipedia article now, Howard Hesseman. Holy buckets! What what is holy buckets? He was later a founding member of the San Francisco-based improvisational comedy tour, The Committee, with fellow actor David Ogden Stiers. Yes. Holy shit. If we ever get a time machine working, Mm -hmm. I would like to stop there. (laughs) No kidding. No. Um, Loved Howard Hesseman. I I loved WKRP as a kid, even though half the jokes went over my head. Well, maybe more than half. But I think he was my favorite Johnny Fever on it. Absolutely. I mean, Johnny Fever, Venus Flytrap, the two of them. And I was super into Head of the Class. Yeah. Head of the Class started in 1986. So he did this on the way to class. Yeah. In the role. Smarmy. Smarmy. Yeah. The role called for smarm. He played the role well. The role Mm -hmm. was gross and icky, but he played it well. Yeah. And yeah, the role called for smarm. I think he did well. I think the character he was playing... You could call him the villain, but in true kid-friendly, Disney-ish, if not uh, directly Disney movie, I don't think they were going to portray the NASA people as villains. They were trying to do their job, and they thought what they were doing was was right and everything, but they weren't trying to actively hurt the kid. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, 1986 is an interesting time to portray NASA in not a really good light. Yeah, We were talking about the movie Space Camp while uh, this was on because that was a different NASA-centric movie with a cute robot pal for a kid to have. And, of course, that movie was made as this cool thing to show off Space Camp and have this adventure with these kids who accidentally get sent up on the space shuttle and trouble ensues and so on. Because you mean they're children in space? Because they're children in space. In shorts, I think. Like, they were not prepared. But then in real life, Challenger disaster happened. And it did. That movie was suddenly not something anyone wanted to see or think about. But I have a question. Yes. Because I've been listening back to our Without Warning episode, (laughs) episode 108, our first Halloween special. Yes. And talking about how NASA Mm -hmm. didn't often lend their actual presence Mm -hmm. to films. Right. They're kind of picky about that. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, where they're busy Mm -hmm. trying to forcibly separate a kid from his family for an indeterminate amount of time, Mm -hmm. how did they let their actual name be used in this one? (laughs) I think they were were still kind of portrayed as not bad guys. They just didn't know any better. And anyway, nothing they did to the kid or the family actually happened at the end because it all got reset button pushed. Yeah. Because that's not, you know... (laughs) But, it but was yeah. all a dream. But yeah, this was a this was a rare occasion of uh, NASA actually their logos and trademarks and all that good stuff were on 
big display. I liked it where one of the aliens on the ship ate the hat. Yes. That was fun. But yeah, Howard Hesseman. We love him. All right. Uh, we'll do these two together. Matt Adler is Jeff Freeman at 16 years old. Albie Whitaker is Jeff Freeman, eight years old. That's uh, his little shit little brother. And what a little <laughs> shit he was. Yes. Can you expand Matt Adler, though? Because he looks familiar, and yes. I don't know Matt, why. Matt Adler has a wiki link. Uh, Albie Whitaker, the younger Jeff, does not. But Matt Adler. Oh. Oh. Okay. Interesting. He was in Teen Wolf, Whitewater Summer, Dream a Little Dream. He does ADR. Uh, he auditioned for the role of Bill in Bill and Ted. But didn't get it because Alex Winter got it. Uh huh. But did you look at his personal life section? Oh, he's married to Laura San Giacomo. He's married to Laura San Giacomo. And is a close friend and former housemate of actor George Clooney. Good to know. But also, oh. he's married to Laura San Giacomo. Yeah. Well, good for him. That's we, pretty cool. We, we like Laura San Giacomo. Ugh. Amazon Women on the Moon. <laughs> doing time on planet Earth. So he's still doing stuff. But yeah, I remember as a kid, I hated the little brother. Rightfully so. Well, the little brother in the little brother incarnation. Yeah, the little version of the little brother. Yeah, well, he was... He was a little shit. Yeah. <laughs> the older version was kind of cool. Also, I found it interesting, though, that every time... Every movie that happens or something like this happens, mm -hmm. and a character has to be convinced that the person who they thought they knew... And the way they do it is by like, hey, this is a thing we have said to each other for a long time. So let's say to each other and it'll click. Mm -hmm. This. Mm -hmm. Big. Yeah. Other stuff. <laughs> That's a common enough trope. Yeah. When he finds himself eight years in his future and his little brother is now a teenager while he's still 12 and he doesn't believe it's him until they like trade the same insults they did when they were kids, which culminate in Scuzz Bucket. Because it's 1986 and people call each other Scuzz Bucket. Did you ever call anybody a Scuzz Bucket in 1986? Because I don't think I did. I don't think Scuzz Bucket was uh, all that high in my list of things to call people. You know, I, I think it's also one of those things that I think we might have heard in movies more than we said in real life. Because the things we were calling each other as kids, they wouldn't put in a family movie. Fair enough. I also feel like the closest I've ever come to saying scuzz bucket mm -hmm. right now, except it, of course, is, you know, the part in A League of Their Own mm -hmm. when they go dancing <laughs> at a roadhouse called the Suds Bucket. Oh, uh -huh, ah, uh -huh, I see. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So Sarah Jessica Parker as Carolyn McAdams. Sarah Jessica Parker as Carolyn McAdams. Young Sarah Jessica Parker with purple hair. Because she went to see Twisted Sister. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. So she was born, according to her wiki, in 1965. She would have been uh, 20, 21. About 20 when they were filming it, When they probably. were filming. Yeah. yeah. So, again, they're supposed to be about the same age. Mm -hmm. But it's weird, man. Like, first yeah. of all, just if we're talking about the integrity of the base. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what, have you been in outer space? Like, were you not briefed? Yeah, did you not see NASA on the building as you walked in? But also, did they not inform you about who, like, what was, ha like, why this child was locked down and why you needed to bring him food inside the robot? <laughs> and, and all of the, like, did they not give you a heads up at all, man? Like, <laughs> I guess if you're an intern at NASA, they immediately have you interacting with, like, maximum security prisoners. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right in the place where they're keeping a spaceship. I'm reasonably willing to posit that the characterization was not the strongest part of this film. <laughs> Shall we say? Well. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of depth here. Okay. Cliff DeYoung as Bill Freeman. Cliff DeYoung. That's his father. Okay. Looking at his filmography. Oh, he was Colonel Montgomery in uh, Glory. He and Joey Kramer were in the same episode of Murder, She Wrote. Uh-huh. Huh. huh. Uh, he was in shock treatment. Of course he was. Yeah, bit parts and things. Oh, oh, yes, I remember him in Star Trek. He was in The Craft? Yeah, he was Mr. Bailey in The Craft. Who's Mr. Bailey? No idea. Cool. Oh, was he like a teacher? Nope, that Sarah's dad. Oh. Okay, Robin Tony's dad in The Craft. Okay, yeah, he's he's got one of those faces. He's a that guy, I think we mm -hmm. could safely say. Yeah. And they didn't do much to make him look older in the future 
No, 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 they did not. Unlike the mom. Well, they just kind of changed the mom's haircut. Clifton Young, uh, apparently the lead singer of the 1960s rock group Clear Light, uh, which played with The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, and Joplin. He was in hair. <laughs> so I think he did an okay job as the dad, given what he had to do in this movie, which was not a lot. <laughs> which was be there. Yeah, just be there and kind of, how you doing, sport, and look concerned. You just got to talk to girls, man. <laughs> yeah. Veronica Cartwright is Helen Freeman. Okay. So I recognized her immediately, and I didn't remember why. Do you now remember why? I looked it up. Mm -hmm. she, I mean, she's been literally everywhere. She's been acting since she was a kid, and she was on Leave it to Beaver, for God's sake. <laughs> no, that's not where I recognize her from, just mm -hmm. for the record. The thing that I really remember her from is an episode of SVU. I know. I know you're shocked. <laughs> what it, was she in SVU? Oh, my God. It's this whole crazy... Was she the killer or the killed? Neither. This was an episode with Dean Cain. Oh, boy. And Dean Cain was preying on women through speed dating, but he had this girlfriend. Uh-huh. Okay. And then the girlfriend was an alcoholic and attempted suicide and the mom and she played the mom of the girlfriend hmm. and that's what i knew her from okay anyway it took a, like a left turn from serial rapist to terry shivo real quick i see it's called starved you should <laughs> i remember her from alien oh, she played sarah kinsey in the kinsey movie huh. oh speed she was the bag lady interesting speed Speed. <laughs> yeah, Leave it to Beaver, Twilight Zone, Dragnet Mod Squad, Serpico. She was in Tanner 88. Wow. And she won a guest star Emmy for ER. She was in The X-Files. She played Jack's mom on Will and Grace. Her sister is Angela Cartwright, who was on the original Lost in Space. Are they at all related to Nancy Cartwright? <laughs> I don't believe so. Okay. I feel like they, they did a lot to make her look different as past and present mom. They had a whole wig on her. She had a whole makeup thing going. They might have given her one of those scotch tape facelifts. <laughs> but, like, she looked much younger in the 1978 part. Fair. And looked kind of frightening in the 86 part as a, as a result. <laughs> yeah. I think given her role in this movie, she did all right. She did what she needed to do. Worried about her son. Yep. That That's that's the role. <laughs> And the voice of Max, the uh, robot spaceship guy, is credited to Paul Mall, the pseudonym that's actually Paul Frick and Rubens. Now, I did not recognize it for a while, mm -hmm. which is interesting because we watch Bob's Burgers. Mm -hmm. We like Bob's Burgers. We do. And I pride myself on recognizing the guest voices yes. immediately. Yes. No, you're, you are a very good voice actor recognizer. So the fact that I didn't get this mm -hmm. until – it was a while. Yeah. I didn't get it for a long time until he started laughing. Which was funny because the character starts out as just this deep voice passive robot who's saying this and that. And the gag is that he scans the kid's brain to get a hold of the data he needs. And then he accidentally gets more from his brain than he needed and ends up with a bunch of like Earth stuff and human stuff in his mind. And then he starts talking more like Pee Wee Herman. Mm-hmm. And so you don't recognize Paul Rubens' deep, serious voice, because when the hell are you going to hear Paul Rubens' deep, serious voice? Wait, I have a question. Yes. When did... Never mind. Sorry. When did never mind? Well, I was going to say, are we to infer mm -hmm. that this child was watching Pee Wee's Playhouse, but we weren't because in 1978 it wasn't an option? <laughs> no, no, we weren't. I think what we are to infer is that scanning all the... Junkin in a child's head just sets this machine to flip out and become a Pee Wee Herman y personality. Compliance. Compliance. How do you think he did? I think it was cute. Hmm. You know, I, I enjoyed the part when he had pulled too much information from the kid's head and mm -hmm. then started talking with him like a kid. Uh -huh. And they were like, Where are we? I don't know where we are. <laughs> don't you know? <laughs> well, I can't read a map. I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah. And also, Yes, I have a feeling that for a while, when we ask each other to do stuff around here, it's going to be compliance. 
Compliance. <laughs> yes. I loved this character. I loved the design of the character. Mm -hmm. I definitely came home and did drawings of, of it. And looking at it now as an adult and noticing the puppetry and how they're doing things, I think they did an excellent job all around with designing the character, operating him, and matching him to Paul Rubens' voice performance. Mm -hmm. I think it was cool. I would agree. And it's definitely the kind of wacky sci-fi character that a kid would have loved to have as his best pal, which is how you judge these movies. Indeed. Also an added bonus mm -hmm. in that because Max was a ship, mm -hmm. he couldn't die. Yeah. Just saying. They could kill E.T. <laughs> you can't kill Max. This is true. Yeah. You no. can strap him down <laughs> under a tarp, but you can't kill him. <laughs> No, and like when he switches on, he could, uh, it turns out he could just break the chains that they had around him and mm -hmm. it didn't even matter. Joey Kramer has David Freeman. Joey Kramer is David Freeman. How do you think he did as the kid, as a kid character in one of these kids' movies? I think he actually did really well. Mm -hmm. The thing that got me the most was this kid was sad and he was scared. Yeah. And he did that really well. He did. Yeah, that connected with me. In ways I hadn't necessarily been expecting, I think. Yeah, for a kid actor, I think he did pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Joey Kramer did a little more acting through the 80s, but ended up getting into trouble. Oh. Clicking over to his Wikipedia article. Oh. And just looking at the personal life section here. Yeah, he ended up in a life of crime, basically. Yeah, but like petty crime, mm -hmm. mostly. Yeah. Petty crime. He he got in trouble. He ended up serving a custodial term, two years of probation, counseling, residing in a treatment center for narcotics abuse. But by all accounts, he seems to have come out the other side of that successfully. In 2018, there was a he had a documentary made on himself mm -hmm. and the stuff he had been through. And I haven't seen it. I want to see it. It's called Life After the Navigator. But uh, apparently, he got his shit together. Good. Which is good. Going back to him in this movie. I was eight, he was 12, so he looked like a big kid to me. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those kids movie kids who I thought seemed realistic. It wasn't obvious that this kid was just spouting dialogue written by a bunch of middle-aged screenwriters. He seemed like a kid behaving like a kid. Yeah. When he's sad and scared and missing his family and wants to go home and and he's crying. Yeah, it's it's a really effective performance. Absolutely. Especially for an 80s child actor, because there were so many bad ones out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fact that he is still alive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, life of petty crime, sure. Mm -hmm. But still alive. He's not, he's neither Corey. How about that? Yes. Yes. He, he seems to be neither dead nor an asshole. So he's neither of the Corys. Well, all right. that's a lot of names. Yes, uh, born Delirious. Would you pronounce that? I have no idea. Delirious? Delirious. Delirious Joe August Fisher Kramer. It's a lot of names. That's why he's credited as Joey Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, more more power to him. And yeah, he was good in this. Under the cast section here on Wiki is uh, is a note: the filmmakers held auditions for the role of David Freeman. Several actors auditioned for it, including Joaquin Phoenix and Chris O'Donnell. Well, Joaquin Phoenix was not Joaquin Phoenix at the time, because he was known as Leaf. Leaf. Yes. And Chris O'Donnell, who I imagine was called Chris O'Donnell. In fact. Yes, the best of my knowledge, Chris O'Donnell's family was never mixed up with the rainbow people. Yeah. Just glancing at the rest of the wiki article here, I like the production section, because it goes into the early CGI and how seat of the pants it was. Anyone interested in CGI special effects should definitely check this movie out, because it's a very early example of such. It's funny because there is a scene where they have the kid hooked up to, what, an EKG or an ECG or whichever, but apparently the alien through the kid's brain starts controlling the computer and drawing a wireframe diagram of the of the ship. And that wireframe diagram, knowing what I know about computer graphics, could well be the actual computer model that they were using to, to animate this thing. What I love about this... Effects were rendered on the Fumli F1 computer before being matted onto the film print. The computer did not have much storage space, so once the frame was mapped, the data was deleted to make way for the new frame. And everyone who works in computer graphics or special effects right now just clenched up at hearing that, because you do not delete your freaking data. But they didn't have the space to keep it anywhere. 
that's the stage these things were at. The look of the ship and how it reflected the scenery around it, I think it was so well done and also succeeded at being something that audiences at the time wouldn't have immediately seen. Mm -hmm. uh, no one knew from morphing at the time. Yeah, we were still a few years before that Michael Jackson video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> early computer graphics, it uses them to its strengths because earlier computer graphics were very good at like geometric shapes and shiny things. You know, you couldn't generate like a realistic person yet, but if you wanted something solid and shiny and seamless, computer graphics could do it well. This ship design is like they said, figure out what we can do well and make it look like that. Mm -hmm. And they did. They did. The stairs, man. The stairs were so cool. I, I loved the stairs. Oh, it finally occurred to me, by the way, why I thought Randall Kleiser was dead. Why did it occur to you that Randall Kleiser was dead? I thought Randall Kleiser was dead because he directed Grease. I mean, that's no reason to wish him dead, but I'm <laughs> Greece was terrible, but still. <laughs> He's alive, but one of the producers of Greece passed away. Ah. Alan something. <laughs> Alan, Alan Carr. Carr. Yeah. Not Alan Carr from Drag Race UK. We're on Randall Kleiser's, the director's wiki page now. Yeah. Best known for directing Greece. Oh, Big Top Pee Wee. So this this was not his last uh, dalliance with Paul Rubens. So he did Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. And Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. And Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, which is the theme park uh, interactive ride movie. Thing. But not Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Joe Johnston directed Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But Randall Kleiser. Randall Kleiser. You get the sense that he's having fun with what he's doing. Yeah. And this was still uh, early in his career. I mean, Greece was in 78, and that was his big one. Mm -hmm. His first movie, Street People, in 1976. Uh, Flight of the Navigator, 1986, 10 years later, was his uh, sixth film listed on his filmography. I don't think you could honestly say one way or the other. Could you say this is a Randall Kleiser film? No. No. <laughs> yeah, no. The, the man does not have a, a niche. No. But I think he did a good job with this. It's a good looking movie. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the spaceship is gorgeous. Not just the computer graphics version, but the set inside the spaceship. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I when love he first it. stepped into it. it, you said, oh, my God, I love how this looks. Yes. And and seeing it on a crisp, clear restoration on this Blu-ray in high res, it's as gorgeous as I remember sitting in the movie theater looking at it. Nice. Wait. Back. Go to the short film section. Oh, my. Uh-huh. So 1964 short called Orgy Beach Party, which doesn't have a wiki link, which uh, is a shame because I'm curious about that now. Oh, but it's unfinished. Also, editor, camera operator, and composer, in addition to director, writer, and producer. I wonder if he'll ever finish it. Uh, Peach Foot Fetish. What the hell is Peach? Oh, it's a student film. About uh, a family whose visit to an elderly relative in a nursing home. With Bruce Davison. With Bruce Davison. And Bill Shallert. Huh. Hmm. Huh. Okay, so I'm guessing the rest of those are also student films. I'm sorry. You think he made a student film called Orgy Beach Party? I mean, sure. <laughs> and a student film called Foot Fetish? Depends on where he went to school. I don't I, know how they I, do I, things there. <laughs> And then Honey, I Shrunk the Audience in 1994. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rest of those were in 1964 and 1973. And a short called The Speech JFK Never Gave in 2017. No idea what that's about. Did a bunch of TV, ABC Weekend Specials, Marcus Welby, Starsky and Hutch. Oh, that's funny. Because there's a bit in this movie where the kid sits down in front of an 80s television and he's like, how come Starsky and Hutch isn't on? And uh, the girl tells him it, that was canceled ages ago. And he goes, but it was my favorite show. Yeah, in much the same way as when they got out of the car, what was playing was a song from the Grease soundtrack. Right. Right. Which, you know, yeah, if, one, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you can't put in your own Easter eggs, then really, what are you doing? Absolutely. I mean, that's a reason to make a movie. <laughs> oh, he directed The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, the horrible old TV movie with uh, with Travolta. Hmm. Huh. So, Randall Kleiser, not dead. And the music in this movie... Yes. Which is funny to think about was Alan Silvestri. Right. Why is it funny to think about? Because Alan Silvestri is known for like big sweeping orchestral stuff. He did the Back to the Future movies. Mm -hmm. He does, he does you know, big scory stuff like that. You know, Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump. Father of the Bride. Father of the Bride. We were listening to the music in this one and it's tinkly, electronic, synth poppy, 
Uh huh. And at the end, over the end credits, the one that was playing, you started singing. Uh, what was it? I said it sounds like he borrowed a oh, motif. Yes. From Sweet Judy Blue Eyes by yes. Crosby, Stills and Nash. Yes, because it, it totally fit the do 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 I mean, it was also the very beginning of this movie, mm-hmm. which was the same theme, which yes. I'm assuming was theme from the Flight of the Navigator. <laughs> over the dog frisbee porn section like what (laughs) yes they fake you out in the beginning because you see uh, a saucer in the sky in slow motion and no that's not the spaceship that's a frisbee that's being thrown at a dog right they do it three different times you know this movie's about a spaceship Mm -hmm. randall kleiser a few times is like Mm -hmm. hey look at that that's not a spaceship yeah right after the dog frisbee contest thing that seems to be going on this tournament Everyone's outside and suddenly this big shadow is passing over everybody and then they look up and it's a dirigible. (laughs) It's the Goodyear blimp. It's the Goodyear blimp. Later, David's out there and he sees a light and he looks up and it's a water tower. Mm -hmm. Like, we get it, buddy. We get it. Yeah. (laughs) The theme from Flight of the Navigator appears to be entitled Theme from Flight of the Navigator. Yeah. Looking at the uh, so it's a combination of theme from the Flight of the Theme from the Flight of the Navigator is a weird combination of sweet Judy Blue Eyes and like... (laughs) <laughs> Jungle Boogie? <laughs> Who's the DP on this? James Glennon does, did the cinematography. He did. He did. He worked as a cinematographer. He worked a lot with Alexander Payne. Hmm. He did the cinematography for Citizen Ruth. <laughs> oh, wow. An election. <laughs> and about Schmidt. Okay. So, so basically, we're going to have to watch the rest of his movies on this show. <laughs> Okay. All right. Looking at the plot section on the Wikipedia article for Flight of the Navigator. Mm -hmm. On July 4th, 1978, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 12-year-old David Freeman walks through the woods to pick up his eight-year-old brother, Jeff, from a friend's house when he falls into a ravine and is knocked unconscious. When he comes to, eight years have passed and it is now 1986. I enjoyed the jump cut there. Like, you weren't supposed to notice? Mm -hmm. Were we not supposed to notice? I don't know if we were supposed to notice. It it was definitely, no, I think we were supposed to notice because it was like, it was daytime. He fell and it was nighttime and then suddenly he's lying there in the same spot and it's day. No, it wasn't day though. It It was was. dark. No, he, when he woke up, it was daytime. I thought it was dark. Nope. Okay. When, when he was out there at night going after his brother, it was dark. Right. Then he woke up and it was daytime. I thought when he walked up to the train tracks, it was kind of dark, like the sun was setting, maybe. We can put the DVD back in. You know, I'm good. I'm good. We can just... We can put the Blu-ray back in. We're fine. We're fine. We just let it go. Okay. I do like that, yeah, he just uh, ended up on this whole journey and dropped off eight years in the future, and you don't know that yet. I think it was effectively done. Like, there wasn't any sort of swirling... Twilight Zone thingy or any any sort of doop, 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 you know yeah there, there there was nothing special about the shot it was just he was there and he was there and then it was he was still there yeah yeah it helps preserve the surprise of the mystery he has not aged and his appearance exactly matches his missing child poster he is reunited with his aged parents and the now sixteen year old Jeff okay hang on this speeds past so much interesting stuff he goes back to the house. Mm-hmm. Other people are living there. They've yeah. completely redecorated it. It's mm-hmm. ugly. Yeah. He goes to his own room and it's a little sitting room with a guy in a bathrobe. The whole beginning section of the movie here is really upsetting. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know what's happening and he's scared. Like when you're a kid and you think that the people that you know don't know you, mm-hmm. that's really scary. Yeah. Or if you can't find them. Imagine the nightmare of being a kid and you go to your house and walk in the door and it's a different house and there's a different family living there. Mm-hmm. That's that's textbook nightmarish. Yeah. And I mean, even getting lost in the grocery store is scary. Yeah. So if you go to your house and there's people there who don't know you and don't know who you are mm-hmm. and you don't know them. Yeah. That's scary. Very. So then they call the police and the police come and pick him up. Mm-hmm. And then the cops are like, wait a second. Look at this missing persons poster. Mm-hmm. Look at the date on it. Yeah. Whoa. And one cop says to the other, oh, it's got to be a typo. And she goes, I've run it through the computer three times. It's not a typo. And it's just funny hearing them call it a typo. Mm-hmm. That was effectively done. And then the, the cops end up driving him to the yes. house where his family lives now. Mm-hmm. They live in a new house. And he sees his family as 
older people. Oh, right. Because they mentioned that mm-hmm. since the missing persons report was made, right. David was declared legally dead. They couldn't find him. They couldn't find any trace of him. Right. He hears them talking about him and he's like, who's dead? And that's such a universal kid experience when you're sitting there and you want to know what's going on and the grownups are talking like you're not there. And then as the police are questioning him and they're asking him things like, who's the president? And he's like, duh, it's Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. This kid clearly believes it's still 1978. Yes, he doesn't know that the president is Ronald Reagan, the actor. He doesn't know it's eight years later. Yes. He gets taken to a hospital. Mm -hmm. They all reunite with him there. And he has the talk with his little brother, who's now older than him. And they know by way of Scuzz Bucket that they are both who they really say they are. Then it's like, okay, we're going to leave you here now. I mean, I don't know. If I were a family member of somebody who went missing and then turned up eight years later, the same age and everything, you know, I I am not letting that person leave my sight. No. I mean, the idea of having one of them there at Mm -hmm. all times, I get that. Yeah. So that's a big ass hospital room. They could have all pulled up a cot. (laughs) Although we don't know. There could have been other people in the room. There might have been like a curtain, another section. (laughs) Meanwhile, an alien spaceship crashes through power lines and is captured by NASA. Hospital tests on David's brainwaves reveal images of it. Dr. Louis Faraday. <laughs> Which... Yeah, a box where you can't use your phone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's an airplane. No, 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 no. It's a box. Uh... Dr. Lewis Faraday, who has been studying it, persuades David to come to a NASA research facility for just 48 hours. Would we say persuades? Well, yeah. NASA is not seen capturing him and dragging him away. The family's like, screw this, they're about to leave. And he goes, don't you want to know the truth? I can offer you the truth. And I only need 48 hours. And don't you want to know what happened? And he gets the kid to say, yes. He engineers consent out of the kid and out of the family to take him to, to NASA. So again, NASA, the actual space agency of the United States, is not shown to kidnap a kid and drag him away from his family. Fair. Once they have him, they fucking keep him, but... (laughs) (laughs) Or at least they try to, but I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Faraday discovers that his mind is full of alien technical manuals and star charts far exceeding NASA's research. Okay, so you know the part that I talk about all the time in Pretty in Pink? Mm -hmm. When... (laughs) When Andy's on the computer in the library Mm -hmm. and Blaine gets into her computer and they start messaging Mm -hmm. and he sends her, do you know who I am? He sends her a picture of her Mm -hmm. and says, okay, do you know who you are? And then it turns into a picture of him and it's just literally Andrew McCarthy in his dreamiest. But that's what it reminded me of Mm -hmm. when whatever alien technology had landed in David's brain Mm -hmm. started talking with Dr. Faraday. Yes. Very interesting. And David's like, I don't know. And it's answering questions on the computers. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that in this movie with all this sci-fi alien crap going on, that was the goofiest non-existent sci-fi technology, I think, in the whole thing, Mm -hmm. was they put basically the Ghostbusters colander on the kid's head and have all these computer screens connected to it. And then they just ask him things and his brain answers in text on the computer screens. Mm -hmm. The implication being that the alien data is in his subconscious and can answer them on, on screen while he's going, I don't know, what are you asking me for? And... The proper answers are coming up on the screens. Mm -hmm. I also think Joey Kramer was very good at playing frustrated and more and more over this. And finally, he tears off the thing and runs away. Yeah. Not a lot of kid actors manage to communicate distress without being like whiny, horrible actors, you know? Mm -hmm. He manages. Faraday discovers that his mind is full of alien technical manuals and star charts far exceeding NASA's research, and that he was taken to the planet Phalon, 560 light years away, in just 2.2 hours. Approximately 2,105,990.4 times the speed of light. Oh, okay. I was wondering what that meant. Yes. C is the speed of light. Good to know. As in equals MC squared. Ah, yes. Yes. uh, Someone on Wiki was helpful enough to add that formula to this. Having traveled faster than light, he has experienced time dilation, explaining how eight years have passed on Earth, but not for him. Faraday decides to keep him there to finish his investigation, breaking his 48-hour promise. And yes, time dilation theory is is a real thing. Hmm. 
the closer you approach the speed of light in travel, the slower time goes for you compared to how it's going outside. Hmm. Now, is that why it took three people to write this? <laughs> you said once we shut the movie off before we turn the mics back on. <laughs> I saw the Wikipedia page and I screamed, it took three people to write this. <laughs> yes, uh, screenplay by Michael Burton and Matt McManus, uh, story by Mark H. Baker. How did this take three people? How? <laughs> did Scuzz Bucket take three people? <laughs> You know how it is in screenplay world. Yeah, apparently. Meanwhile, we have not yet talked about Carolyn. No, we have not. And she becomes relevant at this point, along with Chekhov's Ralph. Yes, Chekhov's Ralph. Yeah, when he first gets to the facility and they show him to his room, and then he gets locked in his room. And then the room is invaded by this giant toaster looking robot that says, pardon me, coming through, stuff to that effect. With a mail slot on it. With a mail slot on it. And behind the robot is Carolyn, mm -hmm. played by young Sarah Jessica Parker. Young Sarah Jessica Parker. And it turns out that the robot is, I don't remember what it stands for. Yeah, R-A-L-F stands for something. Robot assistive likes food or something. Yes. <laughs> and so it brings meals and mail, mm -hmm. and the Sarah Jessica Parker of it, I don't know. It was weird talking about bands, talking about food. And he says, I want a Big Mac and a Coke. And mm -hmm. she says, great. Do you want new Coke, classic Coke, cherry Coke, diet Coke, or caffeine-free Coke? Yes. And this poor child is so confused. Yeah. It is funny because he's he turns on the TV and... Uh, he sees uh, a music video. He's looking for regular TV. The music video is uh, Lose Your Love by a band called Blamange. And, and that means vanilla pudding. Pretty much. <laughs> And it's this freaky, like, synth-pop, punky-looking thing that freaks him out. And in comes Sarah Jessica Parker with a purple streak in her hair, which he comments on, and she goes, Oh, yeah, I just went to a concert last night. We saw Twisted Sister. Who's she? Yeah. She goes, It's a he. Actually, it's a them. They bond a little bit. She asks him, Who did you kill to get put in maximum security over here? And that helps to illustrate what's going on with him. Mm -hmm. Well, we knew he was locked in that room. And, and through the whole yeah. thing, he's been hearing a voice. Mm -hmm. He starts hearing this voice at night. In the hospital. He hears it in the car on the way into the base. Ah, yes. I've forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And going back to they skip over it here, he starts pleading with Carolyn, like, I got to get out of here. How do I get out of here? And she can't help him with that, but she agrees to go see his family and tell them what's going on. While she leaves, she turns back to him uh, through the doorway and goes, you know, you're cute. And he gets this big dopey smile. Right. But again, weird because she's... She's, At least a teenager, if not in her early 20s. Yeah. And he's 12. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically 20, but 12. Yeah. I I didn't get anything untoward from that. I think it's just a sort of a, you're a cute kid, but also as a kid being told you're cute by an adult lady, even if she has weird hair <laughs> and like strange music, there's a kind of like, uh, hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes. Following a telepathic communication from the spaceship, David secretly boards it and meets its robotic commander, Trimaxian drone ship, Max, who calls him the Navigator. So how does he get onto the ship, Rob? <laughs> yes, he hears the voice saying, David, David, are you coming? He goes, yeah, I'm coming. What do I got to do? And then the Ralph robot enters the room and the voice tells him, get into the Ralph unit. This robot with this big empty space inside that's usually full of food and mail and whatever is empty and he can crawl into it because he is a kid. Mm -hmm. He puts on his same outfit that he was wearing when he left the 70s. He just happens to and grabs his backpack and crawls into the robot. And of course, hijinks ensue. He's riding in the robot across mm -hmm. the base. He's not supposed to be there. And yeah. people, I mean, obviously they don't know what to be looking for him. But like mm -hmm. at one point, there are lots of dogs in this movie. Dogs yeah. everywhere. Yes. The movie starts with this montage of dogs chasing frisbees in, in slow motion. But also someone is walking across the NASA base yeah. with a dog. The security guy with a guard dog. Who starts barking at the Ralph unit. And the security guy is like, oh, come on, we'll get you your own breakfast. Because mm -hmm. he just assumes he's barking because there's food in there, not because there's a person. <laughs> and you see this happen. And I guess the implication is the ship's computer is controlling the robot and bringing David over. Yes. And so David uh, goes in and sees the spaceship. 
the security there catches him going into the spaceship. The sirens go off and everything. Because they think there's like a radiation risk or something. Yes, Dr. Faraday is worried about the radiation, which is delightful. <laughs> nice little wink there. He gets into the ship. And they have a nice little chat and they decide to go places. The robot's calling him Navigator and the kid expresses the desire to get out of there. And so the ship takes his orders. Compliance. Compliance. He says, get us 20 miles away from here. So Max decides they're going 20 miles up. Mm -hmm. At like ridiculous speed. So he's plastered against this metal chair. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the peanut butter and jelly thing. Yeah. Doing a pretty good gravity face. Yeah. Yeah. Get us 20 miles away from here is much like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich instructions. Yes. Technically, he obeyed the order. Spread the jelly. Yes. Okay. So you get, you know, <laughs> spread jelly all over your hand. What? You didn't say where to spread the jelly. <laughs> yes. And he goes, I didn't mean 20 miles straight up. I meant along the ground. And, and Max just goes, oh. Compliance. But yes, uh, the Max reveal, I, I think, is really cool. The The whole sequence of him entering the spaceship and looking around and just how everything looks and how they managed to film all these scenes in a spaceship where everything is mirrors and not catch the camera crew and reflections. Mm -hmm. That must have been such a pain in the ass. But well done. Very well done. I'm not a navigator. Yes, you are. Yes. Oh, and the moment when the scientists were rushing in before they decided to leave and Max was like, oh, alien life forms detected. And he was like, aliens? Where? Mm -hmm. And then all these human beings came running in and he was yeah. like, wait, they're people. Yes. Everyone's an alien to someone else. Very true. They escape from the facility, and Max tells David that his mission is to travel the galaxy collecting biological specimens for analysis on Phalon before returning them to their homes. Phalon scientists discovered that humans only use 10% of their brain, which I think is discredited. That's linked on Wiki to the 10% of the brain myth. <laughs> That's not actually true. You use your whole brain. It's your brain. Uh, not the first place I heard this, though. Yeah, no, that, that's been a persistent... It was a theory, and it, I think for a time it might have been the accepted theory, but it's been well and truly disproven. And uh, even though they based a bunch of really interesting sci-fi on it, it's not real. Well, that's unfortunate. Yes. Phelan scientists discovered that humans only use 10% of their brain and, as an experiment, filled the remainder of David's with miscellaneous information. Max returned him to Earth, but not to his own time, having determined a trip back in time would be dangerous for a human. When Max crashed the spaceship, the computer's data was erased, so he needs the information in David's brain to return home. So, this kid is a USB stick. Do you ever watch Chuck? Chuck? NBC show Chuck. I don't believe so. Okay. It's about this guy who works at a Best Buy analog. Mm -hmm. His brain gets implanted with a CIA supercomputer. Uh -huh. So he sort of becomes a spy. Mm -hmm. So he spends all his time with his CIA partner and his... NSA handler. <laughs> I really liked it. It was on for a few years. I watched it. Hmm. Crazily enough, I watched a spy action program. With overtones of sci-fi. Yeah. Years before we met. Hmm. That was the thing that was making me think of. Between yeah. Chuck and also Defending Your Life. Okay. Do you remember that whole thing about how on Earth humans only use however much percent of your brain, mm -hmm. but in Judgment City you can use more? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once you move on, you learn mm -hmm. to use the rest of your brain. So the spaceship you see in, in the beginning when they first show the spaceship, it's crashed through a bunch of electrical pylons. And the concept is that the electricity erased a bunch of the computer systems in the ship. And so he needs to get the copy that's in David's brain. Ah. Okay. While Max prepares for a mind transfer, David meets other alien specimens on board and bonds with a Puck Marin, a tiny bat-like creature that is the last of his kind after a comet destroyed his planet. That's the word I couldn't remember before. Puck yeah. Marin. Puck Marin. Puck Marin. Yes. It was really cute. Puck Marin. That's the guy that hosts the WTF podcast. Uh, yes. 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 The he's, one on, that he's on Glow. Gallagher yeah. walked out on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Dating Lynn Shelton when she died. Yes. Um... <laughs> Or Mount St. Helens when she blew. <laughs> no, the whole thing with all the, the various alien specimens, mm -hmm. that was super fun. That's where you get deep into puppetry. That's like the puppetry showcase. There's this little section in the wall where Max has to go program a computer, but there's also all the other alien creatures in these little terraria that are in the wall. Mm -hmm. One of them eats David's hat. Uh, You're lucky that wasn't your head. Yes. 
Another one is very disagreeable because it has a cold and it's just like a worm thing crawling around in a lot of slime. The implication being that this creature is rolling in its own snot. Yeah. And then the cute little guy. And then the cute little guy. And the one that's just like a giant eyeball. Yes. The one that's a giant eyeball. And when it opens its eye, it screams, I, 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 I. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I can imagine being super into that if I was like a child. Yes. The Puck Baron was cute. Puppetry rods were only visible every so often <laughs> on this restored Blu-ray. Yeah. But, you know, it, it was it was nicely done. During the mind transfer, Max contracts human emotions and behaves eccentrically. And that's when he goes into peewee mode. Right. Would we say behaves eccentrically or behaves like a 12-year-old boy? <laughs> yes. Yes, I think both are applicable. For K no los dos. Exactly. His and David's bickering trigger UFO reports in Tokyo and the U.S., that whole sequence is cute. Yeah. Oh, here's Miami. No, it's not. It's Tokyo. What's wrong with you? Like, yeah. Yeah. If I were in a vehicle piloted by two 12-year-old boys. Mm -hmm. And of course, Max just scanned David's brain so he knows what David knows. But David doesn't know anything about how to get to like different parts of the world from each other. So oh, he doesn't know anything. I mean, yeah. he doesn't know where his family lives now. That comes into play later. Yeah. You see the ship hovering over Tokyo and then the very 80s part of the movie that doesn't age well is you see all the Japanese people pull out cameras and start taking photos of it. Mm -hmm. Because that was a stereotype of the day. Like, oh, those Japanese people, they're running around taking pictures all the time. Yeah, it was wrong then, wrong now. Then he's zooming around here and there, and they stop a car full of kids to ask for directions. Hey, I think that might be that twisted sister Carolyn was talking about. Yeah, they're, they're in a convertible listening to rock music. Because there's a whole point where David says he wants to listen to music, and Max says, I don't know music, but I can pick up. All the radio waves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you hear classical and David says, that's not music. Yeah. While they're arguing with each other, David calls Max a geek, which is still an insult at this point in history. So Max is like, oh, a geek, am I? So he shuts down and goes, you fly the ship yourself. And these metal eyelids close over his, his globe thing. David starts panicking and he's like, take it over, you know, stop us crashing. And he's like, you called me a geek. Because he's being a 12-year-old yeah. boy. And later when they stop this car and ask for directions, the kids in the car just freak out and drive away. And Max comes back to David and goes, were those geeks? Mm -hmm. And David goes, yeah, those were geeks. <laughs> I thought it was very cute. It was. Meanwhile, NASA intern Carolyn McAdams, who befriended David, tells his family about his escape in the spaceship. So Faraday has them confined to their house and Carolyn is sent back to the facility. When the spaceship stops at a gas station, David calls Jeff. <laughs> that was a fun scene. Yeah, the whole thing was a fun scene. The mm -hmm. The guy who owned the gas station was just, what? Yeah. His kids thought it was a place to play. Mm -hmm. And David is making this phone call and he's like, I don't know where we live. <laughs> he calls Jeff. He knows the phone number somehow, but. Uh, well, maybe they kept the phone number. Yeah. He borrows change from the guy mm -hmm. who's this big dude. I think it's named like Big Al's. Yeah. The, the station. And he goes, that must be Big Al. So he parks the spaceship right in the spot where a car would pull up to get gas, which is funny, and comes out through the liquid metal doors down the floating stairs and goes up to the guy, can I borrow some change to call my family? And the guy just wordlessly, as he's staring at the spaceship that just landed in front of him, reaches in his pocket and gives the kid some change. So David goes off to call his family. This car full of tourists pulls up in the other space. Minivan, wood paneled minivan. Mm -hmm. Chrysler Navigator. Yes. <laughs> it's oh. a nav Oh, very good. Very, very good. That was a good catch. I would never have caught that. <laughs> Nicely done, dear. Thank you. Mom and dad get out of the car. And Mom has to pee. Mom has to pee. And they're like, can, can she use the bathroom? And Big Al's just standing there still staring at the spaceship. And he goes, whatever. And she goes to use the bathroom. The kids run out of the car. Can we go look at the spaceship? And dad's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And just figures it's a tourist attraction that's set up. And starts asking Big Al, like, how do you build that thing? How do you get it to float like yeah. that? The kids are climbing up the stairs and dad's like, they don't have insurance on those things. Get off that. Yes. <laughs> and, and so you see David make the phone call. He makes a collect call. Then why did he need change? Because he makes a collect call. He manages to talk to Jeff, his brother. He tells him, I want to go home, but I don't know where the new house is. So Jeff starts giving him directions. Do you know where this is? And he's like, no. And he goes... Just give me some kind of signal that I can see from the air. And then when he's coming back from the phone, he stops at the snack machine, puts the change in the machine and buys a candy bar. 
So he borrowed change to use the phone, didn't use the change to use the phone because he made a collect call, <laughs> then spent the change on a candy bar. So the money did eventually go back to Big Al. Yes. But that is such a 12-year-old boy thing to do, and mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> The kids are posing for pictures with the spaceship, and David just walks right past him up the stairs into the thing, and they all uh, watch the liquid metal stairs form back up into the spaceship and the ship fly away. And Big Al says to the dad, he said he wanted to phone home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clever. So what does Jeff do? When the spaceship stops at a gas station, David calls Jeff who sets off fireworks on the roof to locate their house. Right. Chekhov's box of fireworks. Yes. Chekhov had a lot to do in this movie. He really did. Yeah. In the in the beginning, they're in 1978 and about to celebrate the 4th of July. So, of course, they've got a big-ass box of fireworks. And later, when David goes missing and is declared dead, his mom refuses to believe it and keeps all his stuff, including this box of fireworks. And eight years later, Jeff is using this box of fireworks that are eight years old and <laughs> they're not doing what they're supposed to do they're not, initially. <laughs> they're not. But just the idea that a family would keep a bunch of unstable explosives around for eight years. People grieve weird, man. People do. But but this was also a big ass box of rockets and, and strings of fireworks. And like, I've never been all that into fireworks myself, mm -hmm. but it seems like a lot. It definitely does. It definitely does. And it seems like maybe not the safest thing to keep hmm. in your home, in yeah. your vehicle. In your kid's room. In your kid's room. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone who knows more about fireworks and has seen this movie can confirm or deny whether or not it was weird. Like the long-term stability of fireworks. Would they still be viable eight years later? I don't know. That's a good question. Also, in the 80s, it was still, I think, kind of not weird for a family to be playing with full-on-ass fireworks. I think that got more regulated later on. But I remember families around the uh, suburbs where I grew up, you know, having big-ass firework collections ready for the 4th of July. That's true. Although, you know, I mean, if your child has already been... Basically kidnapped by aliens for eight years. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst going to happen? You can blow off a finger? Okay. <laughs> I guess. David and Max arrive there, but NASA agents have tracked the spaceship. Throughout this movie, NASA is somehow able to track this thing. I don't know what kind of tracking systems they would have been using that could keep up with this thing as it goes all across the world and 20 miles up into space and back down and uh, out in the other direction. And there's one at the point where Max and David got into an argument and David was supposed to be navigating it himself. Like mm -hmm. somehow they knew that and they yeah. were like, come on, buddy. Yeah, they're following it every step of the way and veering this way and that way. And, and it's going to crash. And they're yeah. like, yay, he did it. Well, how do you know? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Unless they had yeah. some sort of microphone on him. I think that's probably more along the lines of them trying to just make sure you know that NASA aren't being villains here. Then they actually don't want to kill the kid. They want him to succeed or at least survive. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Fearing institutionalization, if he remains in 1986, David orders Max to return him to 1978, accepting the risk of vaporization. Yeah, so earlier they'd been talking about how his inferior mind and body couldn't necessarily handle being returned to his own time, that Max tried to return people to their own time, but mm -hmm. he didn't think David could handle it. Yeah. His plan was to return all the little puppet creatures to their own planets in their own times, so it would be like they never left, but he couldn't do that with David. Until David says, I accept the risk. But a bunch of people from NASA are standing on the lawn. They're trying to separate him from his parents, yeah. step away from the ship. There are and cops he's like, and like soldiers and all I that. I can't do that. And the idea that he had been separated from his family, was back with them, mm -hmm. still wasn't entirely sure what was happening, mm -hmm. but knew he couldn't continue to live that existence. Brave. Very. Brave. Very grown up moment for the kid. The way he actually puts it is, I don't belong here anymore. Yeah. That's my family, but it's not my home. Mm -hmm. So he's ready to risk everything to get back to his actual home. Yeah. His actual time and place. Yeah. It was touching. Mm -hmm. He awakes in the ravine. Awakes? That should be awakens, Wikipedia. Yep. He awakes in the ravine, walks home, and finds everything as he left it. During the 4th of July celebration, Jeff sees that the Puck Marin has stowed away in David's backpack. David tells him to keep it a secret, while Max flies home across the firework-lit sky, calling, See you later, navigator! And that's the end. The end. And he tells them all that he loves them. Yes. Even Jeff. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, Yeah. That's odd for this 12-year-old boy to just be this forthcoming about his emotions right now. Mm-hmm. And little shit Jeff apologizes to him for jumping out from behind a tree and scaring him. And he goes, It's okay, I love you, little brother, and... Then you see the little puppet poke its head out of David's bag. Yes. 
So none of the family is aware that any of this has happened, but David Mm -hmm. is. Yes. So that's interesting to know that you've got Mm -hmm. this extra knowledge, but having averted this negative outcome for your family. Mm -hmm. He also knows what the musical trends will be like in in eight years. (laughs) He knows he doesn't like Blamange. Don't buy that album when it comes out. (laughs) And at one point he says to Carolyn, do you know what it's like to be stuck in a place and be told everything you have to do and have no idea why? And she's like, yeah, every time my dad gets new orders. Mm-hmm. Okay, so she's a military brat, so he's going to – I'm assuming yeah. that he's going to keep an eye out for her mm. when she gets to Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> and then they're going to date. <laughs> you know, they, they they never made Flight of the Navigator 2. Who knows? It, grown up David could have ended up with uh, Wait a second. Sex in the City. Wait a second. This character's name is Carolyn? Yes. Okay, go with me on the second. Okay. Okay. Do you know what uh, Sarah Jessica Parker's character's name is in Sex and the City? Um. Her name is Sex in the City. Her name is Carrie. Oh, okay. So how about the, what is their last name? Freeman. Thank you. The Freeman family leaves Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. David and Carolyn never meet. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, after her disappointing NASA internship. (laughs) In which nothing happens. Becomes a journalist (laughs) and moves to New York. (laughs) And buys a shit ton of shoes. Et voila. Et voila. Then she finds love and he dies on a bike. Yes. <laughs> but he was never kidnapped by aliens. He was never kidnapped by aliens, but he dies on a bike. Yes. See, that's what Sex in the City could have used. More time travel. More time travel, more aliens and spaceships. Fewer but, bikes. Then, then I might have watched. <laughs> but yes, that is 1986's Flight of the Navigator. That is Flight of the Navigator. And... This Blu-ray has a ton of special features, which uh, I'll go through without you. (laughs) (laughs) Are there goofs? I like those. I don't believe there are goofs. Damn it. It's funny to watch a gag reel with adult actors screwing up, but I don't know if you want to watch a child make mistakes and call that entertainment. (laughs) Fair. Unless they were funny. (laughs) There are all these vignettes. Directing The Navigator, new interview with Randall Kaiser. Producing The Navigator, new interview with producer Dimitri Villard. Playing The Navigator, new interview with Joey Kramer. Mother of The Navigator, new interview with Veronica Cartwright. Brother of The Navigator, new interview with Matt Adler. I guess they couldn't get Father of The Navigator back (laughs) for an interview. And uh, and some other... Wait, they could get Sarah Jessica Parker? (laughs) Strangely enough. Feeding The Navigator? (laughs) Interview with Ralph? Although I think she commented about Flight of the Navigator. I think it was in her random roles on AV Club mm-hmm. or something to that effect. I mm. remember seeing something. Uh, there's an audio commentary with Randall Kleiser and executive producer Jonathan Sanger. A special effects featurette. Yeah, this this is a solid Blu-ray investment. And I'm, I'm glad to have grabbed this from Second Sight Films, who are, you looked this up and learned that they are a, uh, a British outfit. Mm -hmm. which explains why this has the British symbol for the universal rating on the front, the triangle. And it also explains why the subtitles kept referring to his mum. The subtitles are in British British. English. (laughs) So. So, it held up for you. It really held up for me. I I am happy with it. I will throw this on and watch it again sometime. See, your Firefly is swooping and duping throughout the galaxy. (laughs) Yes, it's, it's 20 miles up. How is this for you? I didn't hate it. That's something. Is it something that I'm going to want to go back and watch again a lot? I can't say that, but I don't regret having put it into my eye holes. <laughs> Which, as we have discussed, is, you know, really kind of what we hope to accomplish in this little experiment of ours. Well, all right. This is one of those kids' adventure movies that I think really holds up for me, watching it as an adult. I thank you for revisiting it with me. Thank you for showing it to me. I think it's a kid's adventure movie, but it also has like a distinct thread of melancholy, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. Good. I enjoyed it. I'm glad. So your firefly kind of meandering. Let's go like North, Northwest. North, Northwest. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So with that, I would like to thank you out there for joining us for this journey on modern technology watches through uh, space and time and all sorts of fun stuff. You can send us messages. You have the ability. So first of all, feel free to find us at our home on the web, which is at modern.com. 
.technology. As a reminder, .technology is, in fact, a top-level domain. So if you just visit modern.technology, you'll find our website. Not only will you find our website, but you will find links to our social media things that we play around with. We're still on Twitter as of this recording, although Twitter is kind of circling the drain at this point, and we may or may not stick around on there. We'll see. But well, uh, it, it depends also if there will be a there there mm-hmm. to stick around on. Yes. So if there's still such a thing as Twitter while you're listening to this, and you would like to see if we're still doing stuff on it, check out MT Podcast Net on Twitter. And... Gila and I are on Mastodon. Yes, we are. And you can also click our individual Mastodon links, which are on the sidebar on modern.technology. All of these things are true. But also, if you go to modern.technology slash contact, you can send us email in the webpage. Also, you can email us at watches at Mm modern.technology or... You can call us. You can call us. Well, you can sort of call us. I mean, you can make a phone call to us, but we won't answer because it's a voicemail only box. So if you want to call us, pick up a phone. This is a United States phone number. 1-929-399-8414. Again, that's 929-399-8414. And... We may play your voicemail on a future episode of this here podcast here, if you're into that sort of thing. Get in touch with us. Follow us. Thank you for being interested in what we're doing here. We appreciate you for listening. to. We appreciate you in general, but thank you for listening to us as well. So for Modern Technology Watches, this has been Rob Vincent. And Gila Drazen. And we will catch you on the flip side. We will see you at the movies. You've been listening to episode 305 of Modern Technology Watches with Gila Drazen and Rob Vincent. Go to modern.technology on the web for more info on this show, our other work, and our social media blamange. Our music is The Promise by Torley Wong, released Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0. Find more from Torley at T-O-R-L-E-Y dot com. Thank you, Torley. Content from Wikipedia.org is used under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 and is a production of Joyful Firefly, LLC. Email us at watches at modern.technology. And if you like us, tell somebody. A cult classic. A cult classic. You're telling me this is a cult classic. Yes, not occult classic. That's Ghostbusters. <laughs> but yes, a cult classic in the cinema firmament. It says so. Right.